How have tens of thousands of people in the UK reversed their diabetes? Today, I'm delighted to welcome both a good friend and the NHS Innovator of the Year, Dr. David Unwin. I first met David after he had graciously agreed to write the foreword of my book, The Primal Cure. I was astounded by his work in reversing type 2 diabetes by simply encouraging his patients to make lifestyle changes before considering taking medication. Dr. David Unwin is the perfect example of a leading medical professional who is unwilling to accept the unacceptable. He has at times put his own career and credibility on the line by openly challenging our dependency on medication. Dr. David Unwin is simply a tour de force of a human being, a true health pioneer, yet given all that this man has achieved, is still one of the most humble and gracious people that I've ever had the pleasure of knowing. Dr. David Unwin, thank you for joining me. You're welcome, very welcome. I loved your speech thank you. uh, the thank other you. week at the PHC. Uh, before we get into that, I've, yeah. I've got to thank you also for writing your kind words in the foreword of my latest I did, book. I did. It uh, was actually a good book. I was surprised, I'll be honest. I thought I'd never heard of you ever. And I started reading that book and I thought, well, where, where's he learnt all this from? Because you're not a doctor. It's a good book. Uh, I enjoyed it. And the things I wrote are sincere. Thank you. Because there's nothing else to be. So, yeah, good book. Well done. Thank you very much. Now, we're going <laughs> to... We could talk all day long, and the reason we could talk all day long about so many health subjects is when you read the list of accreditations that you've got, NHS Innovator of the Year, uh, you're the Senior Medical Advisor for Diabetes.co.uk, you're the Ambassador for All Party Parliamentary Group on Diabetes, and it goes on and on and on and on and on. You're a founder member of the Public Health Collaboration, where I heard you speak yep. uh, a month or so ago. So I thought, what topic shall we cover? But I want to title this, Can I Reverse Diabetes Type 2? And we'll probably go off on a few different avenues yeah. through the hour, but let's focus in, can I reverse diabetes type 2? Because I know that's a hot sub subject for yourself. Mm. Um, but before we get really going, tell us a little bit about your story. Okay. The answer is yes, by the way. Good. We could just stop at yes. Okay. You can, but I suppose you want a bit more... So you've asked me. You've asked me about that. Ask me again. Tell David. me your story. Where, my how story. did you get into um, a medical okay. life in medical career? Because I believe, like myself, you're a bit dyslexic, and yeah. that, that doesn't normally go right. Well, uh, as a child, I was fascinated by animals, absolutely, and I used to love rearing tiny animals. I was a sort of person. I remember I went to school with two baby thrushes every day, and I was hand feeding them at school wow. and rearing things, and I wanted to be a vet. And then, uh, so I have dyslexia, and in those days, people didn't really believe in dyslexia, so they thought I was probably lazy or something. And it became clear that I, would, I wasn't clever enough to be a vet. Really? Because, yeah, the qualifications to be a vet are harder than a doctor. Wow. So I ended up in medicine by default, <laughs> uh, because I, I liked the idea of the sort of healing things. Mm -hmm. I would have liked to have done animals, and I ended up doing people. Uh, and so that, it was, yeah, just because I wasn't bright enough to be a vet, that's how I ended up in uh, medicine. Well, that's perception, not reality, because mm. you are extremely bright and the world is definitely a better place for your, I would say, analysing your patients in your own area and what you've learned and taught us and the movements you've started around diabetes and the public health mm. collaboration. The world's a far better place for what I would say is a, a higher level of intelligence than most people could understand. So okay. let's, 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 let's get that right from the very beginning. Yeah, this is not a that's doctor really that lacks intelligence. This yeah. is a doctor that's on a different stratosphere when it yeah. comes to intelligence. So, so you went to medical school. Yeah. Tell us a bit about uh, your own uh, area of the, where you practice medicine and your own practice and right. some of the learnings over the years. Yeah, yeah. So uh, I went to medical school in, in Liverpool in the north of England. And then uh, I ended up as a GP in Southport, just because it's a nice place to live. I chose general practice because I love the continuity. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, you, you want to be a doctor because you want to make a difference to people's lives. 
But continuity means that that difference can be so enormous because mm -hmm. I've known my patients now for 35 years. Sure. I've seen them grow. It's so fascinating. And if you're a nosy person, it's great because they trust me as well. It's kind of relaxing because they know me so well. And so general practice for the continuity, I quite like the idea of being a larger fish in a small pond. Mm -hmm. So rather than being, if you're a surgeon or something, yeah. That's one thing, but it, in my, to my own community, I really care. Yep. And I think a lot of what was to happen later is, is rooted in the fact I really, really care. Mm -hmm. And the patients know that, and so that they're more likely to listen to me. Um, but then what happened over the years, so everything I've done for diabetes has been since 2012. Okay. Before 2012, I, was, I hadn't done anything unusual at all. In fact, so I, I, my model of diabetes at that point was that it's this chronic condition that gradually you get worse. And uh, that with type 2 diabetes, I expected you to deteriorate and then I'd help you with more drugs. And that's mm -hmm. what I was doing. Uh, and then what happened in two, well, 2012? What, <laughs> what happened what was, was I, I was becoming really, really disappointed in myself. Because, it, you know, if you've got eyes to see... I could, I knew the patients weren't, they didn't seem to be getting better. Mm -hmm. uh, I just seemed to be medicating them and giving more drugs and they didn't seem to me to be improving in health. In fact, they seemed to get fatter and heavier. And it was, if, you, if you're a doctor because you care, it's really upsetting to see people get sicker. Mm. And I was uh, deeply disappointed in myself. Deeply, to a point where uh, people with type 2 diabetes, they, they be, became my least favourite patients because I couldn't bear to watch what would happen. And uh, so by that stage, I was a senior partner. And so I used my senior partner power to move the whole portfolio of diabetes to a, gen, a junior partner. Wow. So I, I, I found it so depressing that I just moved the whole thing. Bless him. And, and, and he, he and I are best, best friends. And now we do it jointly. But that's how low I became, uh, that I, 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 you know, those same people now, those same overweight people with type 2 diabetes are my absolute favourite human beings yeah. because I can see the potential in them. So and just, I, I know we can do it differently. So just clarify that. You, you're in your practice. Yeah, around area, 2012. The, 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 so we're talking seven years ago yeah. uh, mm. approximately. And you just felt... that. The, your whole thing for getting into medical in the first place was yeah. to help people, and, and, you're, and you're lost. You, you're That's prescribing right. more and more drugs, but actually nobody's getting yeah. any healthier. Yeah, and I was, I was confused. Yeah, because it seems as if all that, everything, so much of what I'd done, the actual day-to-day -day results were disappointing. Mm -hmm. So I started to wonder if I did, if I was as clever as I thought. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, I considered leaving medicine altogether. Yeah. I so nearly retired because I was 55, I think, then, or coming up to 55. So you yeah. can cash in your, your GP pension when you're 55. And so I, I'd worked out what it was and I considered leaving. And what's so surprising now, you know, like yesterday I'm seeing, right up to yesterday I'm seeing the most amazing patients. Mm. What a, you know, such a transformation. And I love medicine. I'm full of enthusiasm. And diabetes has been a gift. So tell me that trigger then in 2012 about the, the uh, you, you have told me once before when I was at your home yeah. and you cooked me a lovely uh, lunch up in Southport. Yeah. You told me about the, the, the patient that yeah. you checked her records and you were going to tell her off because she'd stopped taking all her medication. Yeah. And That's right. I, it's a bit boring. I've told people this rather too many times, but we'll go, all right. No, I'd love so, to hear it all right. My viewers would love to hear it. All right, viewers, for you. Um, yes, so we, we check up on our patients and we know who's taking what, because the computer systems tell you who's, who's cashing their, uh, their prescriptions in. And I had a patient who I'd known for many years, and I knew she, she wasn't using the metformin. And um, nor was she coming to see me, so she'd vanished. So I, I, I wrote to her and said, would you, could you come and see me? Because I've, you know, I've got concerns or whatever. And then the, the embarrassing thing is when, when she came to see me, uh, I thought the wrong patient had come in my room. Mm -hmm. And I was trying to send her out saying, no, you know, I'm sorry, it's Mrs. Jones' appointment. She said, I am Mrs. Jones. And to this day, I didn't recognize because she'd lost so much weight. She looked really fabulous. 
she looked really fabulous. I was so confused because I was expecting to see a sick person mm -hmm. and she really wasn't. And uh, when we did the blood tests, she'd, um, she actually put her diabetes into remission. So she wasn't taking my tablets and yet she was in the best health for years. I was fascinated and confused. Mm -hmm. and, and I owe her such a lot. She taught me a lot because she said, well, Dr. Amin, you know, diabetes, isn't it really about sugar? And didn't you know that bread digested down into sugar? And in my heart, I did know that was true, but I'd never mentioned it to her once. And she mm -hmm. said, you never told me. Uh, and I tell you, and she said, uh, and breakfast cereals, they're the same as well. They turn into sugar. And, oh, and so does rice. And that, you know, that's all I've done. Wow. Um, and I was really humbled, I was very sorry. Mm -hmm because it was plain that she didn't actually need the drugs I'd been giving her for years because the results were better without my drugs. So it really made me think a lot ab about what was going on. And how did she discover this on her own that she researched? Well, what was really interesting and even more bizarre to me uh, was I asked her that because talking to her, she knew a lot. She was a well-informed person. And she said, well, there's, there's about 40,000 of us. 40,000, yeah, they, it was like a secret society. Um, they, they were on a forum on, uh, on the internet and they were teaching each other how to do this thing. And I went on and it was true, they were there. Huge numbers and they were all so kind to each other, so mutually supportive. But the darker side uh, was people like me were rubbishing what they did. Right. So healthcare professionals were saying, well, you know, if you don't take your drugs, anything can happen. And so I felt as a, as a group, they were almost disenfranchised because mm -hmm. they, they had nobody rooting for them. Yeah. Uh, so uh, having learned more about it, I, I thought these people, they should be represented mm -hmm. and uh, they need a doctor to uh, look into properly what they're doing. In fact, yeah. um, so I did that. Yeah. And I went online to say, I'm here, right? I'm gonna, you know, I, I want to publish stuff, I want to do research. And uh, the, they instantly suspended me as a troll, instantly. What, they locked, their website? Yeah, they <laughs> locked my account. And uh, my teenage children thought that was just so funny. <laughs> so funny, it gave me, dad has street cred yeah, at credibility. Because I didn't know what a troll was and yeah. they had me investigated. And they actually, the, the people who run the website yeah. came to see me in Southport and check. I was a senior partner of my practice. Because they, I was properly qualified. Because you were, you were one of the first doctors in the UK to say, actually, you're onto something yeah. here. Previously, I think other healthcare professionals had looked at what they did, thought maybe it's dangerous, and then rubbished them. Right. So they, they felt that I was just coming online to poke fun at what they did, mm -hmm. and they weren't going to allow that again. It was very embarrassing for me, mm -hmm. deeply embarrassing. But in a way, it helped me a lot, because it, it made I thought, if they think that, Something's gone badly, badly wrong. What, it, what are we doing wrong? And, um, and, and that's come full circle now because you are now a senior medical advisor for the very same To the same organisation. Diabetes.co.uk. I am, UK. yeah, because when, uh, when the people who run that, when they came to check, uh, they arrived and looked around and uh, we ended up best of friends and we discovered that we'd got shared goals and they could see I was passionate and I was not going to rubbish them. And uh, we together, they... They had just done, actually, they'd just designed, they'd, they'd taken what they'd learned from 40,000 people mm -hmm. and they'd produced uh, an online um, teaching module of eight separate little videos. Mm -hmm. But they hadn't got a doctor to help them, so they'd written it, yeah. but they hadn't filmed it. Yeah. And so when we discovered that we loved each other, mm -hmm. uh, they said, you couldn't help us. And, and so I, we, we had to do it all in several weeks. Oh. And then we produced the low-carb programme and I think about over 400,000 people have done that now around the world. Yeah, we'll come to this in, in, in some detail. That's the end of the story, though, isn't well, it? We'll really? come to that in some detail yeah. in a moment, because I want you to not get confused between diabetes.co.uk and diabetes UK, because they're two different things. Diabetes.co.uk, 400,000 members, they have reversed, or in remission, should I say, 
many people with or help them uh, go in remission with diabetes. But I want to come all full circle back to your practice. Yes, so right. this lady's come in, you didn't yeah, recognise her. I didn't, she looked fabulous. She stopped taking her medication. And her diabetes was in remission. She's in remission. Yes. And prior to that, is it true that certainly most doctors thought that diabetes type 2 is chronic, progressive and degenerative. In other words, there's an other medication you can't really do anything. That's what I thought, yeah. because that's what I had seen. Mm. So for, for, what would that be, 25 years or something, yeah. that's all I had seen. Right. I'd never seen one patient uh, put their diabetes into remission, so I didn't know it was even possible. So that had me wide awake and fascinated. So personally, my model was it was deteriorate. That's what had made me so depressed with the whole subject because there was no hope in it. Wow. And she humiliated me, which was what I needed it, but she gave me hope because I thought, well, wow. Yeah. If, you know, and then when I went online, I tell you what the other thing, was when you read these stories of these people and they lost so much weight and they were doing this and that, it, it, was, it was riveting. I, was, I couldn't, I was loving reading it, all these happy stories about type two diabetes. So it was a refreshing, so refreshing. What you're gonna find in this next hour Back to the question, can I reverse type 2 diabetes? You're going to find how a GP from the northwest of the UK in, South, in Southport, who, like myself, dyslexic, who was a GP in his practice, still a GP in his practice today, has come so far in the last few years, because you only discovered this in 2012, yeah. till a couple of weeks ago you were sitting with Mike Hancock the, uh, uh, the, what is he, he's the he's government's... Really, he's uh, a secretary for health. Secretary of Health in the UK yeah. currently, uh, 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 advising on certain subjects. So uh, this journey is fascinating, but we'll, we'll keep dipping in and out of your journey. Yeah. But I want to inter, sort of interject into there yeah. some understanding about what is diabetes type 2 and how or can I reverse it? Because, um, as you know, it's a subject really close to my heart because yeah. my dad's been diagnosed yeah. only a year ago. Uh, with diabetes. So for, let's assume people listening or watching on YouTube or listening on the podcast know nothing about diabetes. Maybe they've had a, a relative or a loved one being diagnosed with type two. Talk us through what is diabetes? First of all, what is it? Right. So type two diabetes, basically you've, you've got a problem with sugar. You've got a problem with sugar. And that's a bit of a bind, really, because you do need sugar for energy. And yet, you can't metabolize it as well. So this is type 2 diabetes, mm -hmm. quite different from type 1 diabetes. Yes. So in type 2 diabetes, your insulin, which is what helps you metabolize sugar, doesn't work as well. Mm -hmm. In type 1 diabetes, you don't produce insulin. So somebody with type 1 diabetes needs extra insulin. Mm -hmm. Somebody with type 2 diabetes, their insulin doesn't work as well. And so it's useful to think, what does insulin do? So insulin is this hormone that we have that helps us deal with sugar. Okay. So what insulin does, it's a hormone produced from the pancreas gland, and insulin deals with sugar. It pushes sugar from the bloodstream into cells. Mm -hmm. So you need sugar in your muscles for energy. But if you eat more sugar than you need for energy for your muscles, the excess sugar, insulin pushes into your belly fat and into your liver. Okay. All right, so that's what insulin does. But what if that insulin doesn't work quite as well? Well, then the blood glucose starts rising. Mm -hmm. because the insulin isn't pushing it as efficiently, so you end up with a higher blood sugar. Okay. And high blood sugar is actually dangerous. Mm -hmm. So a higher blood sugar over time, it attaches to proteins in an irreversible way and starts damaging your circulation. Okay. So it damages the small circulation in your eyes and your kidneys, which is why we worry so much about vision for people with type 2 diabetic, mm. diabetes. But it also, over time, dam damages your large circulation in your arteries. Right. So that's why we worry about hearts and strokes mm -hmm. and diabetes. So that um, having a high blood glucose isn't good news yep. over time because yep. it, it almost ages your body. Mm -hmm. And so, the drugs I'd previously been using 
for, uh, for people with type 2 diabetes were to try and get rid of that sugar. Okay. But actually, you could think of this in a very different way. So if the problem is sugar, mm -hmm. should you not eat less sugar? And that's what that lady said to me. That's right. what she meant by, did you not tell me about bread, breakfast cereals? Because her point was, why do I have to take your metformin? Because I'm not having sugar now. Mm -hmm. So why take drugs that deal um, with a sugar? Why don't you just have less sugar? Yes. That sounds logical. Now, there is a flaw in all of this. Mm -hmm. um, the flaw is, so where would you get your, your energy from? Okay. If you think about it, isn't yep. it? Because you, so well, how, how, if you cut out sugar, how would you have energy? And another really important part to the jigsaw is that nearly every cell in your body is actually like a hybrid engine. You know, like these new cars that can run? Yes. Or they've got, you've probably got one. Uh, they do electricity or mm -hmm. they do diesel or whatever. Yep. So actually most of the cells in your body can burn sugar, but they could burn fat either. Mm -hmm. So the lady that had cut out sugar and starchy stuff was burning fat. Mm -hmm. And I didn't really know that was possible either. Okay. So that was my other learning thing. I, hadn't, I thought you kind of need some sugar. And, 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 and she was able to say no, because I'm not having any. I must be burning fat. So that uh, I think that's an important part. It, it opens up the possibility in type 2 diabetes that you would cut out the sugar that you can't really deal with mm -hmm. and eat something else instead. I mean, the key thing is you're, you're absolutely right and um, that the body is like this switch, isn't it? It's black and white. You're either diesel or you're petrol or you're electric or, yeah. or, 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 or you're petrol in the sense that you're either burning sugar or you're burning fat. And it I, seems I, it's almost like one or the other. That is a really important point. And that, that is so... Insulin, again, is kind of a boss hormone. Mm -hmm. So that insulin um, was designed really to get rid of sugar. So in a sugary environment, it yep. would make no sense to burn fat mm -hmm. because you need to get rid of the sugar because it's dangerous. Ah, that's another so way of looking in, at it. Yeah, yeah, so insulin switches off your ability to burn fat. Okay. So that if, like, I used to eat a lot of biscuits. Mm -hmm. So if I was eating biscuits all day long, yeah. I wouldn't be able to burn fat because the high sugar levels meant that my own personal insulin yeah. would switch off my ability to burn fat. Mm -hmm. And in a way, that would explain very interestingly, how is it that when I was eating biscuits all day long, I was continually hungry, and yet I had quite a big tummy? Mm -hmm. Because I had fuel there, but I couldn't reach that Good fuel nonsense. because I kept up a, a, a sort of sugary environment because I felt I needed it for energy or coping or whatever. But that same sugar stopped my ability to burn fat, so I couldn't burn my own belly. Mm -hmm. And what's interesting is obviously now, since I've gone low carb, I'm quite slim. Mm -hmm. Because I burn fat now. Yes. So I, I can run, I can do stuff. So yeah. I can burn fat. Is, is that important for people that are overweight that want to lose weight to understand that while you're consuming sugar, which is also carbohydrates, one of the same thing, therefore you're a sugar burner, therefore you can't access your own fat stores, therefore you can't burn your own fat, therefore you'll never lose weight. Yeah. And I, th I think that's where the, the, the subject of moderation doesn't do very well. Mm -hmm. So I used to talk a lot to patients about moderate, like everything's fine in moderation. And when I think back, that was nonsense. Because mm -hmm. what does moderation mean to you or somebody else? Sure. What, what's moderation in biscuits? I thought moderation biscuits was about six a day. <laughs> Is it? I don't know, what does it mean? But also, it, 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 in that way, yeah. it kept me needing sugar mm -hmm. and it made it impossible for me to metabolize my own fat yes so that i i think i see type 2 diabetes as a it means in a way po uh, sugar is kind of a poison for you mm -hmm. because you struggle to metabolize it mm -hmm. so why would you have more yeah and also in terms of if it is a poison why would you wish to be moderately poisoned it's why would you not do a, a yeah such a good point why would you not do a proper job uh, <laughs> and, and there a is like a very important thing we need to say here now to the viewers and yeah. that is if you have type 2 diabetes and you're on medication, mm -hmm. 
you can't just go low carb without chatting to your doctor about it. Mm -hmm. Because there are some medications you may be on that if you cut, if you cut the carbs, cut the sugar, then uh, if your medication is also reducing sugar, mm -hmm. you could have a hypo. Yes. So that, that's just something that the general public needs to know, that if you're going to change prescription drugs, you do need to discuss that yeah. with your GP. But you... Uh, and just explain quickly for those that don't know, what, what is a hypo? So a hypo is where you have a low blood glucose. So yeah. if you cut out your dietary glucose and you're on drugs that also reduce your blood glucose, yeah. then obviously you could reduce your glucose too much yeah. because it can, as well as being too high, it can yeah. be too low. Sure. Um, and the, some of the vital functions we have need an amount of glucose. Yeah. So most people with diabetes would wish to avoid a hypo. So if you're on prescription drugs, you'd have to, if you're going to go very low carb, you need to discuss that or even low carb. Yeah, and I think what Dave is saying, correct me if I'm wrong, is that it, 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 if you're on medication at the moment, you need to speak to your doctor and say, look, I understand this thing about going low carbohydrates. By the way, we keep saying carbohydrates and sugar as if they're separate things. They are completely the same Thing. Carbohydrates break down into sugar inside the body. Some break down faster than others, and that's for a topic for a, another day. But um, all carbohydrates turn into sugar. And the thing is, what we're saying is, in fact, didn't they used to call diabetes sugar diabetes? My old, well, my older patients still do, and and uh, I think we cause it. We why are we calling it type one and type two? My older patients still call it sugar diabetes, and I think that makes far more sense. Oh, of course, it does. Then, then my dad would understand it. Yeah, he would. Sugar diabetes, you have diabetes because you can't deal with sugar, therefore cut down the amount of sugar. Try that for a couple of weeks. In fact, let's, let's, let's say if you're already on medication, speak to your doctor before you go low carb. But what happens if you've just been told that you're either pre-diabetic type 2 or you've just become diabetic type 2 before prescribing medication? Is this a time when people should say, okay, I'm going to make a lifestyle change yeah. and look at diet? Well, it can make all the difference. It can make all the difference. So that, again, in my own practice, um, for most people, they don't actually need drugs at all. So most people, um, if they go cut out the sugar and starchy carbs that turn into sugar or digest into sugar, that's the wonderful message of hope, mm -hmm. that instead of it being chronic, progressive, deteriorating, uh, for so many of them, are able to avoid lifelong medication. And when I ask people, how do you, I, I don't think I used to be honest with my patients. I don't think I told them we're starting something now that'll be for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And what I find is if I say to patients, right, we, you've got type 2 diabetes, we can approach this in, in two ways. Uh, we, we could start the metformin, we could start drugs today but that is for the rest of your life. And metformin has pros and cons. There are possible side effects. Yep. Or are you interested in a lifestyle alternative? Are you interested in diet and cutting out sugar? And mm -hmm. you may be able to avoid medication. Mm -hmm. And what's so interesting is what I've asked every single patient in this position for six years, yep. and not one person has turned down my offer wow. of let's do it. And I, I think to be honest, you know, maybe I was particularly bad. I think maybe lots of doctors give patients this choice. Lots of doctors and nurses and dietitians give this choice. But I wasn't because I didn't believe people could make such a difference. And now I offer patients the choice. Yeah. And they, they seize it with both hands and we get amazing results. And, and why, do you, why do you think people choose to make the lifestyle? Is it about hope? Is it about over-prescribing of medication these days? I think it's a... I think... I'm adopting a far more grown-up way with my patients. I'm treating them more as an equal. Yeah. I'm not assuming that I am the expert yeah. in their life. Yeah. Uh, I'm letting them, I'm, they're joining in the decision-making process. Mm -hmm. I think that's the first thing. So instead of waiting, um, they don't wait for me to tell them what to do. I'm yeah. discussing pros and cons. I think the message that your future depends on you mm -hmm is a good one. Yeah. That, you know, you have different futures. Which yeah. one are you going to pick? Mm -hmm. So yes, your diabetes could get worse and worse. Mm -hmm. But equally, if you and I work together, it doesn't have to. So which future are you going to pick? Yeah. If you know it's there. Sure. But before, I didn't, I didn't know that patients could have different futures or I didn't think of it in that way. 
Well, it's not your fault. You keep saying, saying, saying it sounds well, like you keep blaming yourself and beating I, yourself I am up, still but, disappointed. But, well, I think it's a but, bit, but nearly, it's a, every, nearly it's a shame. every doctor, and still today, yeah. when my dad was diagnosed, still say it's chronic, progressive, and degenerative, yeah. and, and therefore the medic, medic, medical cabinet is the first thing, and medication yeah. is the first thing they reach for. Um, so don't beat yourself up so much, because actually, I know, because I've been doing some research, and yeah. I've been looking at some graphs, that your surgery right now is a shining light. Tell the story about, you've actually sent some money back to the yeah. treasury, some 50,000 yeah. pounds last year, sent back for medications that you just didn't use. We did, but so if year on year, you're saying to patients, um, shall we start medication? And of course, repeat medication is like uh, a standing order on your bank account builds up and up. And if, if I'm not doing that day on day, and if my partners are not doing that day on day, We've actually got to a point now where we spend, I think it's about £40,000 less per year right. than is average for our area on drugs for diabetes alone. Yeah. And then last year we sent back to the Treasury £57,000 of unspent drug budgets. Well and that's in the NHS. And that doesn't have, it's not often that people say, no, don't give us the money. We, we <laughs> couldn't spend it and it went back to the Treasury. The tragedy is that none of that money came back to the partnership or to the practice to fund the very approach mm -hmm. that made those savings. And so that it, it's not really encouraging for GPs because you have to do this extra work, uh, which is wonderful and I see wonderful results with mm -hmm. patients, but it, it's not exactly a money earner for the practice. Sure. Uh, but it is great for your soul. Yeah. It's great for your soul and we see results. And it's, I mean, it's not easy to say to somebody, you've just got to change your lifestyle and change your diet and let's see what happens because no, it's again, most people don't understand what carbohydrates or don't. proteins or fats are. Yeah. So you did something wonderful, and I believe you're still doing it, in, in that you realised it, it was then obviously about sugar and carbohydrates. Then didn't you start, and I think, correct me if I'm wrong, you still run every Monday a clinic for, for, for your area? Right, so that the, there's several threads there that happened. The first one... Uh, the first one was that we found it was possible to help people with diabetes, but we had no money mm -hmm. at all. And the partners at the time didn't know this approach was great. So they, they said to me, well, David, it's wonderful what you're doing, but we'd really, you really ought to concentrate on sick people. <laughs> and the, the fact I was using up appointments yep. on people with diabetes was mm -hmm. annoying yep. because equally there are people with chest infections and other yep. things. So it was creating tension within the partnership. And really, I, I owe my wife, Jen, for this, because one of the barriers to, to helping was money. And so it was Jen, my wife, who said, well, why are we thinking about money? Let's think out of the box. What could we do for free? Mm -hmm. And so we came up, Jen came up with the idea of group work mm -hmm. because she previously, she's a psychologist. Mm -hmm. She'd done really good group work for people with irritable bowel syndrome. So she had the skills to deal with maybe 20 people at a time. Gotcha. So we started on a Monday night. So my wife staffed it for free. Obviously I work for free. And I, we had such a wonderful nurse called Heather. And she really believed in what she said, I'll work for free. So the three of us on a Monday night started working our way through the people with diabetes in the practice. And we've been, so we had a meeting this Monday. So those clinics, the not a clinic, those group meetings have been running for six to seven years now. Wow, good on you. And it's actually, what's interesting is we did it to save money, but it's actually more effective in some ways because you get to meet patients who are experts. Mm -hmm. And you, you might be more impressed by a bloke like you who does it than you would a doctor telling you, I don't know. But so I have brilliant patients who help teach other patients Fantastic. within a, a safe environment. Mm -hmm. And so the new people get to meet somebody, I did this five years ago, or they get to see somebody that says, well, I've lost four stone. Right. So that's the origin of the group work. Basically, we were forced to do it because we had no money at all. Yeah. Well, and then, good on you because yeah. from that, A, you help a lot of people and, and show that it is possible to reverse diabetes or, or to prevent it. But at the same time, I think you help the wider audience because that's why we all get together these days at conferences because we're realizing some of these things, you know, are preventable, are reversible are curable, well curable is the wrong word to use, but um, I, one thing I'd want to ask around exactly the same thing is that, so you've 
just given us that one word of warning earlier on that if you're already on medication before you jump and change your diet, go and see your GP. Yeah. But let's say 50 people come to your uh, to your surgery this year that have just become diabetic and they're not on medication yet. Yeah. Are we talking about maybe one in, uh, let's do it to 100, let's make the maths easy. If 100 people came to you in, over, let's say, a year and had just become diabetic or they were pre-diabetic, are we talking about like one in a hundred that might not meet, need medication, or are we talking ten percent, twenty? I mean, I, I don't want to say, right. get a hard number, but is it the odd person, or is it maybe many people? Or? Most, most. I think it's most. So that if I think back over since twenty twelve, all those people that I've looked after, how many of those have actually come to need drugs who started off? Hardly any. Wow. And what, I think what's even more exciting, so I've got a paper on the go at the moment. Mm -hmm. So one of the points is if you're going to do an unusual thing in medicine, keep records, keep really careful records mm -hmm. to find out because in a way we're pioneers. So you need to know what happens to people. So yeah. I really know what's happened. So my uh, patients give their consent to sharing their anonymized data to help science. Mm -hmm. So I've actually got hundreds of patients and I know what happens to them. So in general, if I took all my, uh, so at the moment, if we just talked about type two diabetes, so yep. I've, at this moment, I think I've got 129 people with type two diabetes mm -hmm. who I've been looking after for years. Yep. Of those 129 who are a mixture yep. from new diabetics to people who've had diabetes for 20 years, mm -hmm. so that's a complete mixture, but of those 45% of those people have got their diabetes into remission without using drugs. Fantastic. So that's a complete mixture of 130. Yeah. Yeah. Old, and the oldest I think is 91 years old mm -hmm. and the youngest is 23. So you've got a complete mixture of all sorts. So at 91 you could even revert. So my dad at, my dad at 79 yeah, so the oldest, still not impossible? Not impossible. Wow. So the, uh, I've got, oh, I would probably know. I think I've got about 60 people who, of those, yep. about 60 of them are over 65. Yep. Wow. Because I have a lot of elderly people. And one of the things I would like to say is that I used to be a bit ageist about this. Mm -hmm. And what I've recently, I'm going into the statistics of it all. Yep. And what's a, a really good message of hope is that actually the old people, two things. They lose weight just as well as the young people. Okay. Because I used to think old people can't lose weight. Right. And I'm getting older myself now, so it's, this is great news. The old people do just as well. And the other thing, which I've only recently, we thought, let's have a look at the stats in the practice. Let's really drill down into who does well, who does badly with type 2 diabetes. The older people do just as well with type 2 diabetes as the young ones. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Wow. And I think that's a great message. That is. So that, you know, I've, uh, there's one wonderful guy who says I can talk about him. And he's 80. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's uh, got his uh, type 2 diabetes into remission without drugs. And he's 80 years old. And he's lost a load of weight. And he looks fabulous. And I'm so proud of him. Because it's, it's, yeah. a, it's a spiral of benefit, isn't it? Because yeah, I, yeah. I guess he's have to lose weight. So, you know, he's probably yeah. more mobile. Or... Yeah. And I think older people, they they're great to work with because their expectations are quite low. Mm -hmm. And so they're so surprised when a doctor says, yeah, we can do that. And this, think of him, he's 80, it's changed his Fantastic. world. He's lost loads of weight. He walks differently, he's got more energy. And he didn't expect, his expectations were just he'd get older and it'd be worse. So for him, it's made a, a, a wonderful difference and old people can do very well. That's, very well. that's really, really encouraging. I think so, yeah. yeah. And, and is, are there, there must be, so if you keep injecting, injecting like my dad does now and don't change lifestyle, so you stay, my dad... I, what do you mean about your dad injecting? What, what's so he dad injecting? dad injects um, for his diabetes type 2, so he, he's putting more insulin in. Right. Well, we ought to explain again. So type, people with type 1 diabetes mm -hmm. have to have insulin, full Agreed. stop, because yep. they need that for life. Yep. Some people with very severe type 2 diabetes also get to need insulin because the, the body, so the insulin, in type two diabetes, your insulin doesn't work quite as well. Mm -hmm. And so your requirement for insulin, you're starting to produce more and more insulin because it's not working as well. Yes. 
But there comes a point where your pancreas cannot su supply enough to get rid of the sugar mm -hmm. because insulin's job is to get rid of the sugar. Yeah. So some people with type 2 diabetes are on insulin because they're, they're coming, their diabetes is so bad, yeah. they haven't been able to deal with the sugar. Mm -hmm. But of course, if we go back to what does insulin do for somebody with type, type 2 diabetes, it's getting rid of sugar you ate. Mm -hmm. So that in theory, in theory, you could wonder whether in, if you could eat a, less, a lot less sugar, mm -hmm. Would you need that extra insulin? Gotcha. Is the question. Yeah. But of course, that needs handling with great care. Mm -hmm. Because if you get it wrong and you cut down your sugar a lot and your dad then injects himself with insulin. You have lots of insulin and no sugar. And that's dangerous. You're unconscious. Yeah. You're unconscious. But it's still as a the theory of it is still very interesting. Mm -hmm. And and there are people with type 2 diabetes who, with their doctor's help, yep with their doctor's help, have come off insulin. So that would be a case, correct me if I'm wrong, of slowly changing your diet and slowly decreasing yes, the amount of insulin to. in parallel yeah. so that eventually, you know, let's just say you start on 10, you, you start to cut down the carbs and go down to nine, cut down yeah. more carbs, come off you, the carbs you need completely. To so that is a cooperation between um, a doctor and a patient who are very motivated. Yeah. So I've got four or five patients so actually the 80 year old was on insulin wow. and he's been off insulin for two years. And that I'm very proud of that case. And he and I worked together very closely to make it happen. That's great. But the weight loss and the fact he's not having the sugar anymore means yep. he doesn't need the insulin. So mm -hmm. together we toned that down, but he never expected to come off insulin. Now, the one thing I struggled with my dad, he said, uh, and I'm not having to go to his GP, I'm sure the GP's stressed oh, we're and very busy yeah. all the time. Yeah. So I think all GPs are wonderful, but uh, they had no conversation around food, first of all. So I'm trying to teach my dad about carbohydrates, fat and protein. He said, and I said, actually, you can live without carbohydrates, Dad. And he said, that's impossible because we're told a balanced diet. Uh, let's not talk about the eat well plate because that's a whole different conversation which we could go off on a complete yeah. tangent. But... Um, my dad said, no, I need all three. I'm taught I need all three. It's a balanced diet. And I said, but dad, because yeah, you know, my dad's read my book, but still doesn't mm -hmm. agree with everything. I said, look, there are cut-off tribes, certainly Eskimos and the Inuits, where they only exist on fat and, uh, and a bit of protein. And, of course, the body can turn protein into sugar if it needs it for energy. I think that's, that's, um, that's what most people do not realise. Yeah, okay. And I didn't realise that either. Mm -hmm. So to be fair to all the GPs out there and all the practice nurses, you know, in 2012, I had no idea that your body can... Or, do you know, that's not quite true. I'd been taught it but forgotten it mm -hmm. because it didn't seem relevant. Mm -hmm. I had forgotten that, yes, you do need a certain amount of glucose to live. Mm -hmm. So you have cells that in your brain, a few cells in the body do need glucose. Mm -hmm. But the genius of the design of the human... It's, or all animals is so genius because your liver yep. can make from fat or protein exactly the amount of sugar that you require to keep your brain going. Mm -hmm. And that, um, so you, the story that you need protein and you need fat and you need glucose is true, but actually the genius is you can produce the glucose yep. from either the fat or the protein and your liver can do that. Yep. And I, I, had forgotten or didn't know that. Mm -hmm. And I'm living proof now because I've been low carb for probably six years. Mm -hmm. So I haven't had bread for a very long time mm -hmm. or any kind of sugary anything. So I'm plainly able to burn fat. Yeah. So there isn't this idea of moderation. Yeah. I think I, one of the problems with moderation, I quite like to talk about food addiction. Can please we talk do. about food addiction? Yeah, well, I'm gonna, I'm gonna is stop, that, is I'm, that all right? I'm, no, well, please don't. I'm going to stop you straight away, though. I'm going to go straight out of the question. Can sugar and carbs be addictive? Because some people say that they're not addictive. I have my opinion. Could yeah. sugar be addictive? Um, clinically, I have no doubt that I've seen. So what's addiction? Let's talk about what addiction mm -hmm. is. And really, this comes back to part of my puzzlement. So I was really confused by my patients who were very heavy. Say the people who weigh 25 stone. Yeah. So if you weigh 25 stone, is that a life choice? No. If you weigh 25 stone, do on the whole, 
do you know that that's not a very healthy thing? Yes, you do. Mm -hmm. On the whole, most people who weigh very heavy know why it is as well. Mm -hmm. So I was totally mystified by these as a group because they would come to harm and yet they didn't change behavior. Mm -hmm. And then one day I had another eureka moment, which was I thought, well, actually some of the behaviors I'm seeing in my patients are similar, mm -hmm. similar to alcoholics. Mm -hmm. So people who are alcoholic very often don't even enjoy alcohol. They tell mm -hmm. me that. They struggle to give up alcohol. They get cravings mm -hmm. and they can't manage moderation. If you're an alcoholic, can you manage a small whiskey? No. So many times I've seen people with an alcohol problem that have been able to come off alcohol and then one drink has finished them mm -hmm. and they've started binging. I've seen people die uh, with alcohol, you know, as an alcoholic, yeah. often. Yeah. But I suddenly realized, I think I'm beginning to see people die through food addiction because yeah. the behaviors are so similar. Yeah. These people are not unintelligent. Yeah. They're intelligent people. They struggle and struggle and struggle to eat less. They, they don't want to be like that. And I think we fat shame them, which is terrible. Yeah. Because we think, oh, you should just pull yourself together. Mm -hmm. But maybe it's not as simple as just pulling yourself together. Maybe some of them are addicts yeah. and that would fit the behavior better. But also, uh, an, an, an addict, like you say, you can't just have one whiskey or... You, no. you, you, you Imagine. Try, try and tell a smoker not to smoke. Oh, well, there's no such thing as one cigarette. Once you've had one, you're back on it. So saying everything in moderation to somebody that needs to lose weight imagine, is a complete nonsense. Yes. So imagine if you were addicted to biscuits or yep. bread or breakfast cereals, yep. being told moderation is fine or that you needed them. Even worse still, if you were told, well, you do need some bread yep. or you need starchy carbs, how would you ever... What kind of a trap are you in? And I've had patients now confess to me, um, you know, that they've, in tears at times, a problem with bread. Mm -hmm. Now, if you don't have a problem with bread, you can't imagine that because you think yep. to stop eating it. Yep. But sincerely, I know people, I've got patients who've confessed, this is why I'm heavy. Mm -hmm. Or I had somebody recently and it was breakfast cereals. Mm -hmm. And... and uh, when he gave up breakfast cereals, because that was his thing, yes. um, he's, he, he's actually put his diabetes into remission. And it was breakfast cereals. It was as simple as that. But he'd always tried. He, didn't, he, he didn't, hadn't got a model where he would, because he would try eating less, and then would end up eating more, lose a bit of weight up and down. Yep. So I actually think this, or I, I think it's a most interesting idea that we should think about behavior around food as possibly having an addictive. Mm -hmm. And we talk about cravings and so many people would admit that chocolate's a problem. Mm -hmm. um, and I'll admit that I used to cope as a doctor with biscuits. Mm -hmm. So I was actually eating biscuits all day long. I had them in the, in the drawer. And I know that if, if, if I was, you'd see a patient's name and you'd think, oh no, they're going to come in and shout, which yeah. people do, or yeah. they're ill or whatever. Yeah. And I would have biscuits to cope. Wow. So some patients yeah. would be a three-biscuit patient. Yeah. I'd have to have three biscuits to face them because, you know, they have difficult lives or, yeah. you know, you've got to tell them sad stuff like yeah. you, bad results. Well, it took me a year to give up biscuits. And I'm an intelligent person. Yeah. So I couldn't do moderation on biscuits. I can't eat one. I think when you study a lot about dopamine and serotonin yeah. and pleasure and happiness and reward systems in the brain and the receptors of how our brains work, uh, there is no doubt about it that sugar is addictive. But I, well, it makes to... sense, doesn't it? It fits in with what many of us have experienced. Mm. You know, and I, I remember, particularly my kids, uh, I used to have a thing for chocolate. And if they, you know, it's awful, but they would have to hide their Easter eggs because if I knew where they were, I would eat them. <laughs> that bad and um, what's the excuse that's terrible and yeah. they, I was just famous within the family you've got to hide stuff good because yeah. dad will find I it I never had Dr David Unwin down as an Easter egg I, Easter egg steal I was a secret <laughs> I was I you was. were the opposite to the yeah. Easter bunny you know, or, or who can eat two squares of, of milk chocolate yeah it's impossible yeah. well you, you say you will but you don't no. or maybe it's three bars yeah. so I really think this is very important this idea of or for people to think about yes. what's your relationship with food. So, Is it a healthy relationship? I think this brings us on to what I think will eventually be part of your legacy, which is a spoonful of sugar. But before we do, let's just recap that, that 
the body turns, bread, rice, pasta, potatoes, chocolate, sweets, crisps, all those things into sugar in the body, okay? So it's really important to, you can't, if you've got a problem with sugar, you become addicted to it, it doesn't matter whether it's cornflakes or whether it's biscuits, they, they turn, a, 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 a good friend of, uh, of yours that you introduced me to, uh, an amazing dentist, uh, was uh, James, was sitting James. here the other week, and he said to me, I said, how quick does bread turn into sugar? He said, Steve, take a small piece of bread, yes. put it in your mouth and chew it for less than a minute, and you, it'll be so sweet, you'll have to spit it out. And he said, I see so many young children coming in that are having their teeth pulled out because they eat too much bread. And I went, really? And he went, yeah. So it's all sugar, sugar, sugar. Now, because it all becomes sugar inside the body, and because diabetes type 2 is really sugar diabetes, the inability for the body to deal with the, that amount of sugar, you were struggling with your patients to, to get that message across that pasta, rice, potatoes become sugar. And you created something called Spoons Full of Sugar, uh, which I know you were talking to the health secretary of the UK about the other day. Because I've seen Matt the Hancock. photograph with you, Matt Hancock, yeah. with your, uh, your yeah, infographic. Talk us through your, right, I'm going to say, yeah. genius way of explaining Well, there's a story, sugar. really. There's a story behind that. First of all, with my patients, there was a pattern I was noticing. Um, so I'd, I'd come across people with type 2 diabetes who had poor control. So their blood sugars were high. And I'd say to them, so, you know, are you having sugar? That would make sense. And they, they would be um, a bit shirty with me because they'd say, well, I'm not an idiot. Of course I'm not having sugar. I gave up sugar ages ago. So then they're really mystified because they're thinking, well, this is weird. I'm not having sugar and yet you're telling me my blood sugar's high. So the question is, where does the sugar come from? Mm -hmm. Great question, where does the sugar come mm -hmm. from? And of course, the, where the sugar has come from is what you were touching on there, yep. which is all sorts. So sugar can come from, some foods are naturally sweet. Mm -hmm. So you've got foods like um, raisins are full of natural sugar. Yep. Uh, a glass of fresh orange juice is full of sugar mm -hmm. because it tastes sweet. So that kind of, you think, well, that's, what, that's sugar. Yep. Then you've got foods which we artificially sweeten, like the biscuits. But the third category is foods which do not taste sweet, but break down into sugar. And this was the group that my patients had missed out on. Yeah. And I had to be, let's be fair, I hadn't talked about that for 25 years with mm -hmm. people. So I started realizing that for many people, they, they couldn't really understand, they didn't understand that starch is actually, it's actually glucose molecules joined together. So starch is just, lots of glucose, put them together, yeah. then digestion, your enzymes, mm -hmm. split it up again, back yeah. to sugar. Yeah. But they, people have no idea how much sugar is in starchy foods. And I realized if I could find a way to communicate exactly how much sugar there is in starchy foods, this would be so useful for my patients. And, and one of the absolutely key things to general practice is you have to be able to explain things to your patients and explain things to ordinary people. Mm -hmm. Now, there was a scientific way to explain this, and that's called the glycemic index. So actually, type 2 diabetes, nice guidelines, quality guidelines, yep. instruct all healthcare professionals that we should be advising people with type 2 diabetes to eat carbohydrates with a low glycemic index. Yep. Okay? Those are the rules. Mm -hmm. But what I discovered was that actually I didn't understand the glycemic index, if I was to be honest. Mm -hmm. I didn't really. And then I took a long time to, to learn about the glycemic index because it was really useful because it does actually explain to you how sugary is this carbohydrate. Mm -hmm. But my explanations were very complicated. Yeah. And the partners in the practice said I was very boring because the way I, it took me a long time to, so I was trying to say, you need to, this glycemic index is really important. And they, in the end, it, it was Cotty Schultz, one of my partners, who's wonderful, and she said, please go away and come back when you can explain the glycemic index to patients. And, mm -hmm. that, and that took me a year. And I realized that the problem was that most of us, we're, we're not really familiar with glucose as a substance. Mm -hmm. So if I tell you, that eating um, a slice of bread is the same as, say, five grams of glucose. You don't know what I'm on about. 
Couldn't visualize you don't know it. what, yeah. you don't know. Yeah. So the idea was, how about we look all over, look again at foods, yeah. not in terms, so look again at potato yeah. and starchy foods, and instead of giving you how many grams of glucose they contain, which is actually the glycemic load, not the glycemic index, that's the glycemic load, the load of glucose that mm -hmm. food produces. How come we just look at that and give it you in teaspoons of sugar? Yeah. And that was my idea, but the lucky thing was that I found an expert who actually, he really did the initial calculation for the glycemic index, Dr. Jeffrey Leavesey, and I must credit him because he readed the calculations for 800 foods. Wow all over again, wow. uh, so that I can tell you that if, if, we, if you took a small bowl of, of rice, 150 grams of rice, in terms of its effect on your blood glucose, that is exactly the same as 10 teaspoons of sugar. Mm. So whether you had 10 teaspoons of sugar or a small bowl of rice, it's the yeah. same. And that single fact, patients are amazed because they suddenly realize, well, they wouldn't, I say, would you eat 10 teaspoons of sugar? Go on, have it now. They wouldn't do it. Yeah. Or if you say uh, a bowl of cornflakes, and they'd say, "Well, I don't have sugar on the cornflakes," and I say, "That doesn't matter. The cornflakes, a small bowl, so thirty grams of cornflakes, which is just a tiny, tiny yeah. mean bowl, yeah. that would affect your blood glucose to exactly the same extent as eight teaspoons of sugar, which is close to a can of Coca Cola. So Easy. Which par most parents now know you don't give your kids." a can of Coca-Cola yeah. in the morning because it's full of sugar. Yeah. But you would but, give them cornflakes. But you would give them cornflakes. Yeah, and it, it breaks down into sugar. So I, I had a patient recently, the, the one I was telling you about yeah. before, well, he was having several very large bowls of cornflakes in the morning, mm -hmm. and he was quite sick. Yeah. But he, he said, well, I'm not putting sugar on the cornflakes. He hadn't <laughs> realised, but when he saw the teaspoon of sugar equivalents, yeah. he, said, oh, he said 30 grams of cornflakes is nothing. I don't know how many I'm having. Well, you know my son Tom, and he's yeah. 13 years old. Yeah. And we weighed his bowl, and he's 13, and he's is closer to 90. So he's having the equivalent of three cans of Coke effect yeah. of sugar on his glucose levels yeah, so, in his blood. The three cans so of Coke. So that's easy. So 90. Yeah. Three. What? What? Three, what's our three eights? The 16, 24. 24. There you go. Yeah. So he's actually having the equivalent of 24 tea. Would you sit there with a son, the boy you love? Yeah. Spooning yeah. that, and, and then. That all sort of these facts as they came out, I was I was amazed. Yeah, I learned stuff like uh, I talk a lot about bananas. Yeah, but again, if you have type two diabetes, a ripe banana is about the same as five or six teaspoons of sugar. Yeah, many of my patients would think that bananas are healthy, healthy full of potassium, so they'd actually chop up a banana yeah. and put that on the cornflakes. I, I, so you I, just I, added I, loads of sugar. Are you okay if on our website, uh, primalivingandhealthdaddy.com, we put some of your graphics up there? Yeah. So we'll, we'll put them on the website for you because certainly parents, when it comes to breakfast time, most of what, yeah. certainly I'm, I'm, I'm 53 and I've got seven children and you know, bought them all up and I always thought I was giving them the healthy choice. It now turns out what I've been doing for my children for, for literally as they've been growing up is actually spiking their sugar levels within their bloodstream, which is dangerous. Sugar in the bloodstream is dangerous. So, so very, very important for us to see that. And you do it brilliantly. So some of the choices that, that you might be doing at home, you might be, you know, a slice of bread is the equivalent of three two teaspoons full of sugar. And you start adding that up to the, the orange juices and the apple juices and yeah. all the things that we thought we were doing. Well, I mean, when I started thinking about it, it, I saw diet differently mm -hmm. for the people with type two diabetes. And it starts you thinking about, well, you had bran flakes for your breakfast because they're healthy. And then you had a glass of apple juice mm. because that's healthy. And you had toast, brown toast, but you didn't have any jam on it. But you just had sugar with your sugar with your sugar. Yeah. And then if you think uh, so many young people would have a mid-morning snack, and then at lunchtime, what might they, they'd have, my kids would have had chips or pizza or something at lunchtime. Yeah. And then when they get home, I'd give them spaghetti bolognese. It, they actually, when you think about it, where's the protein? Because they're having sugar all day long. And it, I think the dentists are right to worry yeah. uh, because what's that? And then, oh, well, I used to give my kids uh, like Ribena because yep. I thought that was That's really healthy. Yeah, that yep. was healthy. So basically, I think we've just mentioned yeah. in the last 30 seconds to a minute, all really, when you look at it, 
sugar, 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 because mm-hmm. we're missing out the fats and we're missing out the proteins. Look, you, you are an absolute pioneer in this area and, and, and we can go on for hours and hours and hopefully one day we'll do a, 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 another show because we can go off in all sorts of directions because I've heard you recently say that actually if you go low carb, you can actually affect your blood pressure in a positive way and, and just goes on and on and on. You're definitely a pioneer for me. You're, you're doing some wonderful things things not just in Southport, but around the country. I ask this of every doctor that I talk to, mm. what would you like your legacy to be in the end? What, 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 what's that one message that, that you want to get across to people in the country? What, what, what's your sort of legacy, your one message that will make the biggest difference? Right. One message. I'm allowed one message. You can have to because you're very special, okay, but most people you. want. Right. I would say... Think very carefully about eating any food that you saw advertised anywhere. Good one. Because if a food's been advertised, then it's probably in a packet. And also how many ingredients are in it? And when I think about the healthiest diets that I see, and people are on the healthiest diets, they're eating real food, food they bought themselves, and they made it into something. So I'd say if it's been adver- if you saw it in the pictures advertised, you saw it on television, what was it? Was it pizza? So that I've thought about that a lot recently. That's yeah, if you saw it advertised, think really carefully about is it healthy food and how many ingredients has it got? And you did allow me to, didn't you? Yeah, go on. Right. I actually think the whole idea about treats and snacks makes me cross. Okay. It distresses me because I've seen the effect. In, so when I started as a young doctor, uh, obesity wasn't a thing. Mm-hmm. And also in, in the practice, in my entire practice, we had just 57 people with type 2 diabetes. In the same practice, the same population, I've got 470. So what has gone wrong? That's to like give, an eightfold increase. It's an eightfold increase. So, so what's gone wrong? Something's gone horribly wrong. Yeah. It must be reversible, mustn't it? Yes. It must be. Yes. Because they're the same human beings, so they're not genetically different. Yes. So I think one of the things that's gone wrong is the idea of treats has gone mad. Yeah. When I was young, treats was a Friday, yeah. right? So treat was a really rare thing and it was yeah. a treat. Yeah. And I think the people who advertise to us are just treat yourself, treat yourself. Have a bar of this and when you buy petrol, do that. And I think we need to bring treats right back to something that is infrequent. That's brilliant. That would be my, my say. It's uh, like uh, it, it, Desert it, Island Discus, isn't it? It is like yeah. Desert Island Discus. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's another way of looking at it is they all sell happiness, but actually they're not selling happiness. They're selling, they're selling rewards, which is yeah. short-term gain, yeah. whereas long-term happiness is about being healthy. They're selling and, tooth decay. I, it makes me mad. Yeah. I am mad because I see so many people suffering. I actually see what happens. I see the. I've got young kids who can't run because they're too fat. Yeah, I've got kids having their teeth taken out. I've got older people having yeah. bits of their body chopped off. Yeah. So let's think about the word treat yeah. and what it's actually Certainly selling you. Treat, is it? So, I, so, I think... so, so I've, not asked, I've not asked you that question yet. We talked about earlier on uh, some of the effects of diabetes type two and we're over time, but I still want to get this question in. What's the link between diabetes type two and, and, and people having it so severe they lose limbs? How does that come about? Is that again right. well, arteries it, blocking up in it the is. legs? It is. So or? that um, again, as I said to you earlier on, so high blood glucose does damage as a function of time mm-hmm. and as a function of how high the blood glucose is. Yep. And the damage is done in two ways: to the small circulation, mm-hmm. these are the tiny blood vessels. So the, one of the things is the tiny blood vessels that supply the nerves to your legs. Mm -hmm. So some people with type 2 diabetes can't feel their feet, called peripheral neuropathy. And if you can't feel your feet, you're in danger of damaging them and you didn't even know. If you add to that the fact that the circulation to your skin isn't as good, you're more inclined uh, not to notice a little ulcer because you can't feel the pain. So your Mm -hmm. skin will be less resilient because it doesn't have a good blood supply. Mm -hmm. You don't even feel the pain because your nerves are destroyed. Right. On top of that, the artery leading down your leg is furring up as well. Right. So three separate ways yep. your legs are in real danger. And I, I, it's just dreadful. So one, some of the cases that upset me the most in my career are you chop off two toes, yep. a third one, and then you take the foot, you know. 
And imagine if that didn't have to be. Yeah. Imagine if those people, if that, what if that didn't have to happen? Because I know it wasn't happening very often in 1986 when I started as yeah. a young partner. Yeah. So let's think really carefully about what's changed since 1986. Let's really think about what we can do. I'm going to bring that to halt there with a promise mm. of a follow-up podcast because we could go on. I, I, there's so many things I want to talk to you about, de-prescribing and so many other things. Fatty uh, liver. Fatty liver. I want we to do talk fatty about liver. Lowering, lowering uh, blood pressure by eating less uh, uh, carbohydrates. We could go on and on. But I think we've answered that question, can you reverse diabetes type 2? Can you put it into remission? And I think the answer there is... There is one final people, thing we didn't say. And that is that, that we should say that we talk in terms of remission, not reversal. Mm -hmm. Because reversal, so people always ask me, can type 2 diabetes be reversed? The problem with that is if you, if you go back to eating the way that you ate before, you'll end up in the same pickle. So it's well, David, actually, David, that's exactly so why it's we remission, changed the name. It's remission, not reversal. That's, that's my absolute, that's, you've all suffered enough now. That's my final word. That's the complete reason why we changed our name from primal cure to primal living. Yeah. Because we were saying, we've cured, so, you know, people have followed our advice and they've cured diabetes. And you're absolutely right, you haven't cured it, you've put no. it in remission. Because if you go back to what you were doing before... You will be in the same, the same state. state. Never forget. That's last word. Thank you. David, it's, as always, absolute pleasure. I enjoyed that more than I thought. And we're going to have to do a follow-up very, very soon. Thank you. If you enjoyed the podcast and would also like to watch it online, you can find a webcam version on YouTube or the Primal Living website, www.primalliving.com. The Fat and Furious podcast is the perfect introduction to helping you and those you love live happier and healthier for longer. And if you are a fan of the series, then please let your friends and family know. They'll truly thank you for it, and so will we. Until next time, live life naturally.